Hey everyone. Uh, so today we're going to be talking about uh, retrieval and question answering, um, which I think in the case of retrieval in particular is something that may come in um, pretty useful um, in the, the research that some of you want to do. Um, but before I get to that, I just wanted to say a word about logistics. Um, and so for the final four classes, so starting um, in about a week and a half, um, we'll have um, you guys presenting your projects. Um, and the goal is to have essentially like a five minute elevator speech introduction to the project and the methods, um, and then five to seven minutes uh, for comments and questions. Um, and the most important thing is that this is uh, useful for your research. And so you should feel free to like uh, approach it accordingly. And so if you wanna give you know a polished presentation, that's great. But if there's um, a part that you're getting stuck on um, or not sure about and would like more feedback on, it's also fine to focus the presentation on that. And so just essentially um, whatever you think is going to be, um, to be the most useful for you. And so we really have a lot of flexibility in the regard and mostly just want this to be, you know, a good learning experience and potentially something that is um, helpful uh, for your research. Um, and so we'll randomly assign presenters to dates, um, but if you have constraints that prevent you from presenting on certain dates, um, <clears throat> please be sure to let Jake know as soon as possible so that we can uh, take that into account. Um, and also like, if you're watching this from a distant time zone, um, we don't wanna make anybody present in the middle of the night. And so if there are students in time zones where this time is um, very difficult, um, then we can potentially like have you kind of record your presentation and we can show that during the class and still have people give comments on it. Um, but then you'd have a chance to, to watch that later and not have to, uh, wake up in the middle of the night for it. So if you're in a distant time zone, um, please also um, let us know about that. Are there any questions at all about the presentations? Okay, um, so now I'll move to the um, topic uh, for the lecture today, which is uh, retrieval and question answering. Um, and so um, the main reason that we're talking about this is because we're interested in, in open domain question answering, which is where you have a query and the answer to that query lies somewhere within a very large um, set of documents. Um, but we're gonna start out today by talking about um, a related task called reading comprehension, which is where um, you want to find the answer to a question in a predefined passage. And this is maybe, you know, not so useful for our research, but it's a stepping stone um, to kind of the more open domain question answering that's more likely to be kind of relevant to, to work that you guys will wanna do. Um, being able to do reading comprehension is a prerequisite for open domain question answering. Um, so just to clarify these terms again, reading comprehension is answering a question over a single passage of text. Whereas open domain question answering is how to answer questions over a large collection of documents. So typically in the literature, that large collection of documents would be something like all of Wikipedia. You know, So maybe I ask, um, uh, what state is uh, Harvard University located in? And then like, you know, somewhere on Wikipedia, the answer, there's gonna be the answer to that question. Um, there is also visual question answering where you ask a question about a picture, which is kind of interesting, but beyond the uh, scope of this course. So we're gonna talk about question answering where the answer is in the text. Um, and question answering, another important reason to cover it is that it has some tie-ins to zero-shot learning, um, which is being able to learn without labeled data. And we're going to talk about zero-shot learning next week. And obviously, to the extent we can learn without labeled data, you know all the better because creating labels is really costly. Um, and so that's another reason to kind of to care about question answering. Okay. And so 
Um, the objective of question answering is to automatically answer questions posed by humans. Um, and um, the earliest system for question answering dates all the way back to the 1960s. I'm sure the system did not do a great job. I mean, I think sometimes we can wonder, like, is this question I'm trying to understand now something that, that people aren't going to understand for another 60 years? And maybe like the technology or the data to understand it don't even exist. But it was kind of cool that people were thinking about this stuff, like, you know, long be before we really had the um the framework or the the hardware to be able to answer it um so question answering has tons of commercial applications um so this is um data from smart speakers which are kind of a prolific device the most common thing people do with smart speakers is to um uh, listen to music um but the second most common thing they do is to ask it a question and this is like important because um you know, as is the case in kind of in all of NLP, the advances in this research are driven by like the people that like make the smart speakers like Google, right? Um, and, um, but we can use that technology downstream. Um, so, you know, I interact with the smart speaker fairly frequently because I have a three-year-old um, who likes to like ask me nonstop questions for like every, you know, single, um, minute of the day, I think so, somebody put a recording device on me, like there would be so much labeled data for questions and answers, but um, sometimes I let him ask the speaker and it's like, you know, you get the sense that this is not really human performance, but it's like pretty good. Um, so his favorite thing to ask, I think is like, you know, hey Google, what time is it on the moon? Um, and if you think about that question, like that's a hard question to answer. You'd have to think about how do we define time and are we worried about special relativity here? Um, but the device to its credit is, is I don't know how to answer that. Um, or like, you know, his one of his other favorite things to ask is um, what is yogurt made out of? I guess because he likes to eat yogurt, um, but the, the speaker thinks he's asking like, hey Google, what's your butt made out of? And has like a very snarky response that you know they must have hard coded into that. And so, you know, in the commercial market, this is a bit interesting, but actually, you know, we can take this technology that was really like developed for you asking your smart speaker all kinds of stupid stuff um, and actually um, use it uh, for your research. Um, this is another fun kind of um, popular press example. So IBM Watson beat Jeopardy, like the Jeopardy champions all the way back in 2011. So in 2011, this was not using a deep learning based method and it was kind of still able to beat Jeopardy. Um, we'll see that there, there are ways that they could have kind of designed it so that IBM Watson would have lost, but they probably wanted the publicity of IBM Watson uh, winning. So, you know, at least if you train it in the right way, you know, these can actually do better than humans on certain tasks. Um, so today, almost all question answering systems use a pre-trained language model like BERT. And so in some sense, like now that we've covered BERT and transformers, like, the rest of this class is maybe a little bit boring um, because it all just, you know, the same thing that we saw, um, you know, with the uh, sentiment analysis, it's all going to essentially use BERT. And so once you understand BERT and its variants, you can kind of do all kinds of interesting things. Um, and so that's going to be, you know, equally true here. Okay. Um, so I'm going to talk first about the reading comprehension problem. I know you guys may be more interest in the retrieval, but this is kind of, it's important to understand this if you want to understand this literature. Um, and so with reading comprehension, um, you give the model a passage of text and a question, and the model produces an answer. So you have a function that takes uh, the passage and the question, and it answers that. And this is an important benchmark for just for evaluating how well language models actually understand human language. And so I have a, qu a quote here from Wendy uh, Leonard, who was like a, you know, a, a computational linguistics person all the way back in the 1970s. And she, she says, since questions can be devised to query any aspect of text comprehension, the ability to answer questions is the strongest possible demonstration of understanding.
Okay. Did I? Okay. And so, um, like in all other, you know, CS, um, you know, um, problems that we've seen in this class, um, this literature is built around benchmark data sets. Um, and in question answering, the best known benchmark is squad. And so if you read kind of in this literature, both the reading comprehension and open domain part of it, you'll see people talking about squad. Um, and so um, it is um, a data set created by people at Stanford. It stands for Stanford Question Answering Data Set. And it has around 100,000 annotated um, pa passage question answer triplets. Um, and so um, essentially the way that they created this data set was to take passages from Wikipedia, fairly short, short passages, so just 100 to 150 tokens. Um, and they crowdsourced questions based on those passages. And so they asked annotators, given this passage, produce a question that can be answered by a span of text in this passage. Um, and this is important. So in all of this literature, um, when you ask a question, the answer is a span of text. Um, and so obviously that is a limitation. Not all questions can be answered with a span of text, um, but that's kind of, that's what um, we are able to do. Um, and today like squad is essentially solved. Um, and that the state of the art performance on squad exceeds human performance. Um, and so the way that this data set evaluates performance is you can have an exact match. So you exactly match the span of text or you can have partial credit. So you get part of the answer right, but you don't get the whole thing. And of course, if you're asking the question, there may be um, different plausible answers, like different spans of text that answer that in the passage. And so they collect three gold answers, which are the correct ones, and they compare the predicted answer to all three um, and take the max score. Um, so how do we build a model um, to essentially solve squad or other question answering data sets? And so you know, if it's between 2016 and 2018, people were using um, LSTM models with attention. Um, from 2019 onward, people are fine tuning BERT or other BERT like transformer based models. Um, and so, kind of the main model in this literature during that 2016 2018 period pre. BERT um, was called uh, BIDAF, the Bidirectional Attention Flow Model. Um, and I'm not going to go into the details of this, um, but it's sort of similar to the seek to seek models with attention that we saw earlier in the course when we were talking about machine translation. And um, so the attention, unlike in BERT, where it's self attention um, over the sequence, um, the attention is between the question and the passage. Okay, um, so that was kind of pre-BERT. Now, what do people do? Um, well, you pre-train BERT, just like we saw how BERT was pre-trained earlier. So you have the next sentence prediction objective on that class token, and you predicting the mask words and you know, they like, you know, if this is Roberta, like Facebook AI did that on, you know, 1,024 GPUs um, using the unsupervised um, objectives um, for the next sentence prediction in the mask. And then you have those, that you have that pre-trained model. And then you take that and you fine tune it on squad or on other um, question answering benchmarks. And the way that you fine tune that is that you have the labeled data from squad and you put in the question and then the separator token in the passage, and you're trying to predict the span. So the start and the end um, of where the answer is located in that passage. Um, so this is kind of an example. And so it's, um, you know, there's the question goes in in the segment A and the passage is segment B. You have a separator token between them and you want the answer is the two endpoints um, in segment B 
um, where the um, answer is located. And so here you have a question, how many parameters does BERT large have? And then there's some reference uh, text. Um, and you can see in there, you know, for a total of um, 340 million parameters, right? And that's where the answer would be. And you have this squad to do this supervised fine tuning of the BERT model that's already been pre-trained on like all of Wikipedia and all of the internet kind of using this unsupervised method. Um, and so because you're fine tuning, you allow all the BERT parameters as well as the newly introduced parameters, um, which are um, the um, start and end tokens um, to be um, optimized uh, together. Um, and so you have 768 because that's the sequence length in BERT. Um, and um, so, you know, obviously you're fine tuning on this small data set as we've seen from other parts of the course, you know, most of those, um, you know, 110 or 330 million like BERT large parameters are not gonna change, but the ones that kind of tend to be relevant to the domain you're fine tuning on, and especially in those upper layers of the model, um, will change some to produce a better performance. Um, and so if we compare BIDAF, which was the state of the art before, uh, to BERT, um, BERT has many more parameter parameters. We saw BERT large has 330 million. Uh, BIDAF only has 2.5 million, so this is just a massively larger model. So not surprising that like BERT is gonna do better because we've seen that that's kind of the theme that larger models in NLP do better. Um, BERT can be parallelized um, because it's built on transformers whereas uh, BIDAF is a, an LSTM. And so it has that sequential aspect that can be parallelized. Um, and so that makes you able to train the model on way more data for longer, which is gonna give better performance. Um, BERT is pre-trained um, using the unsupervised language modeling objective, while BIDAF is only built on top of the glob embeddings and all the remaining parameters need to be learned from supervised data sets. Um, and so kind of a theme in all these tasks is starting with pre-trained BERT makes like a really big difference, like or pre-trained BERT variants. And obviously at some level it's costly, you know, um, Facebook AI maybe spent like, you know, millions of dollars, like um, pre-training Roberta on like over a thousand GPUs. Um, but like, you know, thanks to the smart speaker markets and the stuff we saw before, thankfully there's an incentive to, to kind of, to pre-train these models. And like um, most of them have been open source, which is uh, pretty amazing for us. Um, so another difference with BIDAF is that it's a seek to seek model that models the interactions between question and passage with its attention. Uh, whereas BERT uses self attention over the concatenation of question and passage. Um, so the attention works a bit differently. And there's a paper that shows that adding a self attention layer um, for the passage attention to BIDAF also improves performance. Um, and so in terms of why BERT's doing better, it's really just, you know, mostly that it's a much larger model that's been pre-trained. And so there's a lot of information in there already by the time you start fine tuning it on squad or on other question answering data sets. Um, it's possible to improve the training objective. So there's a paper in 2020 that shows that they get improved performance on question answering uh, by masking spans of words in a BERT-like model rather than masking 15% of the words at random, which is what BERT, like um, what the main BERT does. And so they call this span BERT. And so you can see it here, they, like, rather than masking random words, they've masked the span of words and that like makes things better a little bit. Um, and so there are kind of ways to play with that training objective. Um, and um, so, you know, one, um, you know, potential note of caution is that, you know, as mentioned, like, um, uh, like on squad, you, if you fine tune BERT to do squad, you beat who human performance, 
but like these are different, like kind of five of the main question answering data sets. And if you fine tune on one of them, and then you, at test time, use another one, the performance uh, deteriorates pretty substantially. And so on the diagonal here, that's where you fine tune and test um, on the same data set, whereas off diagonal elements are where you're fine tuning and testing on different data sets. And that leads to a pretty um, steep kind of decline in performance. Um, and so obviously um, uh, the model is learning something pretty specific um, to what it's been trained on. Um, these are also like, you know, from another paper in 2020, where it's talking about kind of different ways to trick um, the model. Um, and we won't go kind of into all these details, um, but if you guys want, you can come and look at this. Like if you make a small typo in the question, it will get really confused. Um, or these are like kind of all cases where, um, you know, where, um, where the uh, BERT large uh, question answering gets it wrong by making kind of some small variation to the way the information is fed that maybe humans would be able to deal with, okay, but that uh, the model has sort of a problem with. And so this is just, you know, uh, examples of other places from this paper where it kind of was um, really able to um, kind of trip um, the model up. Okay, um, so that's reading comprehension. Um, does anybody have any questions about that? Okay, um, so now I wanna talk about open domain question answering, which is kind of the more um, practical problem. And so rather than assuming a given passage um, has the answer to the question, an open domain question answering, you have access to a large collection of documents. Um, so for example, like um, in this literature, it's almost always like, you know, with the benchmarks, you have access to like all of Wikipedia and you don't know where the answer is located. And so you have to break down this problem. So first of all, you need a retriever to pull out a predefined number of passages. So for example, you might say to pull out 100 passages that may contain the answer. And then you need a reader, um, which is just the neural reading comprehension model that we just learned. But then you apply it to the passages and see which of those passages has a span of text um, that's identified as the answer to the question. And note that like, kind of in a lot of tasks that you might wanna do, you might just want the retriever. You may not care about specifically answering a question. So say that you have a large number of documents and you want to pull out ones that are about a particular topic. Um, and so one approach to that question could just be to label data and train a classifier. Um, but the problem with that is, let's say you really have a vast collection of documents. You have, you know, all of Wikipedia or you have like, you know, um, like uh, millions of newspaper page scans or um, vast um, meeting notes from companies. Or you just have a vast collection of documents and you want to classify which ones are about a particular topic. And so you could just have a classifier, but the problem with that is let's say that only like one in a million documents or one in a hundred thousand documents are about topic that you're interested in. How are you gonna pull out the data the label like for your classifier? Um, and so one approach you might take is to write a prompt, like a question that is a prompt um, for the sorts of material you want to query. And then you use retrieval, which we're about to talk about, and it may not be perfect, but now let's say 50% of the documents that it pulls out are the documents you want. Then you can use that as labeled data to train a classifier. Now you get kind of a balanced sample between being the topic you want and not that topic, that then you can run that classifier on everything, but retrieval allows you to kind of pull out a sample that's very skewed towards the 
um, the topics you want to find, which are rare in the overall um, database. So you can never just um, label by random sampling. Um, or maybe just using the retriever by itself is already good enough and you don't even need the classifier. Okay. Um, and so the way that retrieval was done traditionally was by a method called BM25 that was developed in 2009. Um, and the idea of this method is to match keywords. Um, so you can see this as representing the question in context in high dimensional sparse vectors with weighting. Um, and so kind of we know from the things that we've talked about before in the course that this method is gonna struggle with complex language. It's gonna struggle with synonyms or paraphrases. So if you're using a keyword type approach and the question you know is like, who is the bad guy in a given movie? And the answer to that, you know, the villain in that movie is like, this method is gonna miss that um, because it's just like keywords are like a sparse representation of language. Um, and that's gonna really inherently kind of limit um, the effectiveness of using um, keywords as a query method. Um, and so now uh, sort of the state of the art on this is something called dense passage retrieval, which comes from a 2020 paper by Facebook AI Research. Um, and the um, Sort of the idea behind this is kind of people knew the problems with these sparse representations, but previously people thought that in order to create good dense representations, which can account for, you know, for complex vocabularies, it would require a very large number of labeled question and answer pairs. And we just, that just doesn't exist. Um, and so then people just kept using the sparse representation, but kind of the insight of this paper, this framework, is that like other examples we've seen in the course, the unsupervised pre-training of BERT really helps. So if you can leverage pre-trained BERT, um, you can train a model to produce dense vector representations with a relatively modest amount of labeled question answer pairs. And so by kind of leveraging the pre-training of BERT, which is totally unsupervised, <laughs> then you're able to fine tune it to your supervised task with a relatively modest number of labels. And this is kind of a theme in everything that we've seen that like pre-training of BERT like, really makes a big difference in terms of um, what you're able to, um, what you're able to do. Um, and so specifically they need what's called a dual encoder architecture. And so let me, explain this um, in more detail. And so DPR um, uses two encoders, hence dual encoder. Um, so it uses a dense passage encoder, which we'll call EP, which maps any text passage to a D-dimensional real valued vector. So they've just divided all of Wikipedia up into passages, and then they use the encoder model to create an embedding representation of that passage. Um, and you do that beforehand. Um, and then at test time, um, DPR applies a different encoder, EQ, that maps the input question to a, a D-dimensional vector and retrieves the K passages whose vectors are closest to the question vector. And it just defines the similarity between the question and the passage vectors using their inner product. Um, and these vectors, the term dense passage retrieval comes from the fact that these are dense vectors. If you have like, um, you know, a, a keyword model, like the size of your vector is like the size of the English language, which is like hundreds and thousands um, of, of words. Whereas the, the BERT embeddings are gonna be like 768 dimensional, right? So you have this much, smaller but denser vector that's going to have many non-zero values instead of the sparse high dimensional vector and you're getting those dense representations by having like two BERTs, a BERT for encoding the passages and a BERT for encoding the question. 
Um, and they choose this similarity function because it needs to be decomposable so that the representations for the passages can be pre-computed, right? Because you're gonna only embed all of Wikipedia or all of your form level reports, all of your newspaper articles, you're only gonna do that once. Um, and then you're gonna be retrieving different things from it. So you need um, the embedding for the passage and the embedding for the question um, to be um, separable. Um, and um, they apply the passage encoder to all passages and index them using this method called FAISS, which is an extremely efficient open source library for similarity search and clustering of dense vectors. And it can easily be applied to billions of vectors. And so we won't go into the details of how this works, but essentially what this means is that DPR is very fast. So you can be having a query over something, you know, like the size of Wikipedia or just a vast amount of text, and it's gonna pull up the similar passages very, very, very quickly, which again is pretty amazing. And so, well, how do they train these encoders? Um, so the objective is to train the dual encoders so that the dot product similarity between the encoding of the passage and the encoding of the question is a good ranking function for retrieval. Um, and so in other words, you know, you have some labeled data and you have a question and you have the passage where the answer is found. So right now we're not worrying about the answer because this is the retrieval component, but we know from our data what passage the answer is in. And so we want the embedding for that question and the embedding for that entire passage that contains the answer to be close together, their inner product, you know, to be small. Um, whereas for an embedding of a question and an embedding of a passage that does not contain the answer, we want them to be far apart in this space. Um, and the topology of this space is determined by the embedding functions. Um, and so they train this by constructing um, instances where each instance consists of one question, one positive passage, and one negative passage. And you want to train the and, and you train it so that you um, um, your objective goes down when the positive passage and the question are nearby, um, and it goes down when the positive question and the negative passage are far apart. Um, so this brings up an important question of how do you choose negative passages? And the paper suggests three methods. So you could just select the passage from Wikipedia. They're training this on Wikipedia. You just select the passage from Wikipedia at random. Um, you could use BM25 top passages that don't contain the answer. So essentially you're doing like a keyword search and you take the ones that um, have a lot of that keyword, but they don't have the answer. So that's kind of making it harder um, for the retriever to distinguish. Um, or the other approach they call gold, um, which is where you take positive passages paired with other questions in the mini batch. Um, and the reason why you'd wanna do this is it's super computationally efficient. And so because those are the positive passages for other questions in the mini batch, you have to embed them anyways. And so you can just reuse those embeddings to be the negative passages. And that allows training to be very efficient um, because you have, you're not having to embed like as many things. And so their baseline uses gold passages uh, from the same mini batch and one BM25 negative passage as the negative ones. And using those gold passages, it just essentially allows for very computationally efficient training so they can train this thing kind of for a long time and uh, you know, at least reasonable for face, Facebook AI research amount of compute. Um, and so the model is trained just on the usual question answering data sets. Um, and one note is that squad, which we saw actually isn't so great for this type of task because 
Um, many of its questions lack context in the absence of the provided paragraph. So remember that this data set was created by presenting annotators with a Wikipedia passage and asking them to write a question that could be answered with it. And because of the way it was constructed, sometimes the question doesn't, it's just ambiguous or doesn't make sense if you don't have the passage in front of you. And so they actually don't use squad, but they use kind of the other benchmark QA data sets. Um, and you see that this does really well. So higher scores are better. And multi just means that it's trained um, on, um, that it's trained on multiple question answering data sets. And so not surprisingly, that's kind of helping um, from what we saw before. And um, it's BM25, it's using that BM25 negative example to train. Um, and then you just see it compared to kind of like the baseline BM25 and it's doing quite a bit um, better, whether um, the in top 20 is, is the answer contained in the top 20 passages that it retrieves, the top 20 closest ones and top 100 is, is it contained in the top 100. So it's still kind of not perfect, maybe about 80% um, of the time the answers in the top 20 and about like 85 to 90% of the time, it's in the top 100, but it's still doing a lot better than the BM25 by itself, which is just like the keyword search. So that's just retrieval. Um, and then it goes on to add the question answering part, which just uses the reading comprehension that we saw before. Um, and it also does really um, well on that and kind of beats the other um, models that were used for question answering. And so in short, it's like really effective. Um, there's another paper that suggests maybe you wanna use decoders instead. And so um, remember that we had like the transformer encoder blocks and the transformer decoder blocks and VERT and VERT kind of variants use enc um, encoders, but the decoder is actually kind of a generative um, model that generates that would generate the text of the question. And so there's some work suggesting this is better, but I don't think it's really resolved. And I would still just recommend using um, DPR because Facebook AI research has really good code. And so you can go and, and download this thing and it's, it's gonna work, which is amazing. Okay, so that is um, retrieval. And as I mentioned before, maybe you don't really care about question answer and you care about something like pulling out um, documents of a given topic in a large collection of documents, you still probably want to use retrieval. And if the answers aren't really quite good enough for you, you can always use the retrieve data and then label those um, to, um, to, to apply a classifier, but retrieval is a good place to start. And you could even just start with off the shelf retrieval by Facebook AI research and it's gonna not be perfect. It hasn't been fine tuned on your example, but you can use that to narrow down, um, you know, the passages that you have to label and to kind of hone in to allow you to do good sampling for labeling where there's gonna be lots of positive examples where there wouldn't be if you were just drawing at random from your document collection. Okay, are there um, any questions at all about retrieval or question answering or any of this? Okay, I think like this is something that's used a ton and hopefully it will end up being useful for some of you all um, in your research. If you're kind of working with a large collection of documents and need to pull things out, even if you don't care about answering questions and we'll see how it kind of ties into zero shot learning next class. Um, so that, that's, uh, that's all I have for today. Thank you.